My name is Antoinette Burton, and I'm the director of the Humanities Research Institute, which is the sponsor of our event today. At HRI, we respectfully acknowledge that we're on the lands of the Peoria, the Kaskaskia, the Piankasha, the Wea, the Miami, the Muscoutin, the Ottawa, the Sauk, the Meskwaki, the Kickapoo, the Potawatomi, the Ojibwe, and the Chickasaw Nations. These nations were forcefully removed from their traditional territories and these lands continue to carry the stories of these nations and their struggles for survival and identity. As part of the land grant institution, we have a particular obligation to recognize the peoples of these lands and the histories of dispossession upon which the university itself rests. As humanists here at HRI, we also recognize that the past is not past and that no field or arena of inquiry is exempt from the responsibility of addressing the legacies of settler colonialism and its contemporary manifestations well beyond acknowledgement such as this. Thus, the statement is also a demonstration of our ongoing commitment to supporting the work of indigenous scholars and communities so that together we are able to envision what poet Joy Harjo, Muscogee Creek Cherokee calls a map to the next world. I'm going to introduce Emily and Katie and turn the podium over to them so they can tell you about the work of WeCU. And when they're done, I'm going to help them moderate any questions that you might have. In the meantime, please feel free to put any questions you might have in the chat and we'll curate those, collect them up and give you the opportunity either to ask them yourself if you want, or I can ask it for you. So it's a great pleasure to introduce these two. Uh, Katie is the director of the Community Learning Lab and co-director of WCU. She has a bachelor's and master's degree in social work and is a licensed clinical social worker. Her background working with at-risk youth, childhood obesity, the aging population, and hospice has led to her particular interest in her current position within the School of Social Work, which allows her to work with a wide range of community partners, students, and UIUC faculty and staff. Katie began with the School of Social Work in 2014. Emily is a public engagement fellow in the office of the chancellor, a research development manager with the College of Education and the Interdisciplinary Health Sciences Institute, and the co-director of the WCU Community Engaged Scholars Program. She works closely with faculty, administration, and community stakeholders to identify, expand, and support new research and community-based initiatives to promote public health. Emily received her BA from Tufts University and her MPH from Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. She's been the university at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign for three years, following four years at the University of Zurich in Switzerland. I'm really thrilled to have Emily and Katie here at HRI, where we're working to help faculty and students reimagine how they might think about the work of the humanities in the world today. Learning about what it means to place community-based partnership at the heart of student learning experiences is a critical first step to moving what we care about in the humanities beyond the walls of campus. And what we learn when we do that is how crucial it is to remember that we are not the only ones on campus, that is to say, who make knowledge, that there is a lot to be learned by meeting community members where they are, and from there creating truly reciprocal partnerships that can transform the way we live together. As Emily and Katie know, I could go on and on and on about them, but I will restrain myself and uh, hand it over to them. Thank you so much, Antoinette, for the invitation to speak today. And thank you, HRI, for inviting us. We are really excited to share with you all about We See You today. And we look forward to answering your questions and hopefully partnering with many of you. Um, we will be speaking today about how you can get involved with We See You, whether you are a student, an instructor, a community member, a faculty member, any or all of these um, and more. So the WCU Community Engaged Scholars Program is supported by the Office of the Chancellor um, Public Engagement. And we have numerous partners campus-wide. It truly takes a village to run this program and HRI is one of those partners and we're really grateful for uh, their support of the program. So um, we see you um, empower students to meet the needs of the Champaign-Urbana community. And we see you started on June 1st. So it's a very new program. It has run uh, last summer and last fall and just begun this semester as well. 
Many people asked us, why would you launch a campus-wide community engagement program on June 1st when our lives were turned upside down by COVID-19? And the answer is really that it was the time it was needed. So COVID-19 reinforced the need to address community-wide issues together. We saw that students were searching for ways to make a difference remotely and that organizations needed support for new challenges more than ever as they quickly transitioned programming online that had never been offered online before um, and offered resources online that didn't exist there previously. In addition, students were feeling isolated um, and many still are, and we're looking for ways to connect and find meaning. We hoped that WCU could help with all three of these areas. So as I said, um, and Antoinette mentioned as well, WCU is really a framework for strengthening student community engagement service at the University of Illinois to meet the needs of our local Champaign-Urbana community and increasingly beyond Champaign-Urbana. And WCU has four main components. Um, the first is a student service recognition program. So when you think of Phi Beta Kappa or Summa Cum Laude or some of these academic honors that are considered to be very important to students, we would love to see students value service in this way. And so WCU creates a recognition program where students are honored and recognized at graduation when they've significantly contributed to service throughout their four years at the university. Um, the current target is 300 hours for students across their four years. And we also offer smaller targets semester by semester to encourage students to participate as much and whenever they can. The second piece is a hub and spoke uh, project matching framework. This is um, really the heart of the program and is done in close partnership with the Community Learning Lab, which Katie Shumway directs. And here we try to lead with the needs of our community partners and hear what kinds of projects they have and then match them with students who have the skill sets to carry those projects out. The third component is a mini grants program for students. And this is really a small part of the program, but an important one. We want service to be accessible to all students, um, whatever financial background they come from. And we know that service sometimes has costs associated with it. So if there's a needed background check or transportation costs, we invite students to um, submit those for reimbursement through this grants program. And finally, training and reflection are really important to the program. We want our students to go out into the community prepared and trained and as uh, a great representation of the university. Um, and so we offer both training and regular reflection sessions for all of the students who participate in WCU. WCU has these three core values that I've already referenced. The first is impact, that WCU scholars are actively engaged in meeting community needs and those community needs really drive the priorities of WCU. The second is experience, that the WCU scholars gain valuable hands-on experiences that build their skill sets and resumes. And we found that particularly this last summer when so many internships and jobs were canceled because of COVID-19, this was a really important way for students to still feel like they were engaging and building their skill sets and adding to their CVs. And finally, and importantly, we want to build a community of WCU scholars. Um, we connect them with other like-minded students. They work primarily in teams on projects and support each other. And as I referenced before, um, we work very closely with the Community Learning Lab and the School of Social Work to match projects from community organizations with students who have the skill sets to carry out those projects. And Katie will talk in a few minutes a little bit more about what this looks like, but these projects are matched either with service learning courses um, or with student groups or with individual students. So they're matched in, in a variety of ways. Um, and I will um, now turn it over to Katie so that she can add a little bit of um, more detail to what we're talking about with projects. Great, thanks Emily. And thanks 
to Antoinette and HRI for such a warm welcome and for this opportunity. Um, so as Emily mentioned, I will shift gears a bit and give you some information about numbers, as well as the types of projects that students are completing throughout the program. Next slide, please. Since June, 800 students have completed community projects and roughly half of those students completed the projects as part of their coursework. The students represented 12 colleges across the U of I campus and we worked with 31 classes just last fall semester alone. There we go. And students completed over 15,000 hours of service and 163 community projects have been completed on behalf of community partners. So as Emily mentioned, the program started just this past June and she and I weren't entirely sure what to expect or just how popular the program would be. So it's really wonderful to give you these numbers today. Next slide, please. So we recently sent out a call to our community partners and asked specifically for their projects that would be a good fit for students in the humanities. This slide includes a list of some of those projects that they submitted. Some requested assistance with grant writing, anti-racism advocacy and training, developing and delivering LGBTQ trainings, and researching university policies related to students with criminal records, and creating social media content and written materials for a magazine that's focused on social justice. Next slide, please. Especially in the early days of COVID, many organizations were providing new or different services or programs, and they wanted to get the information out to as many people as possible and in multiple languages. We found that students from the humanities were uniquely suited to, to assist with translating materials into languages such as Spanish, Chinese, and Arabic. Students assisted the New American Welcome Center, the Urbana Business Association, Champaign Center Partnership and Urbana Parks District with material translation. And I want to mention that I have included very humanities related project examples here, but the scope of projects that are submitted to us extend beyond a humanities focus. And I will continue to provide more examples of those types of projects shortly. Next slide, please. We'll spend the next few slides providing some information about types of service learning courses that we've worked with in the past, as well as some common service learning course structures that we've seen. Next slide, please, thank you. I mentioned that last semester we worked with 31 different service learning courses and we're available to help identify community projects that would be a good fit for courses and we act as a matchmaker for those projects and courses. While I have never taught a service learning course, I've worked in the context of matching projects to service learning courses since 2014. And this slide shows some examples of the different types of service learning courses that we've worked with. So master's level students in HDFS 595 are developing surveys on behalf of community partners this semester. College of Media students in advertising 492 are completing marketing campaigns on behalf of local community partners. Freshman level students in LAS 199 are creating social media content. Senior level social work students are working on a variety of projects and are contributing 28 hours of service towards those projects this semester. And master's level social work students are creating policy manuals and are developing and delivering staff trainings for community partners. And lastly, master's level social work students are creating an element of program evaluation on behalf of community partners. Next slide, please. So there are a lot of different ways to do service learning, but I thought it might be helpful to show some common themes that we have seen that work well. It's common for one course to partner with between two to four organizations. So I will say that I've seen some courses that work with one community partner and some that work with more than four. It's kind of a matter of preference. Students often work in small groups on these projects. 
and students often have course time designated for their project work. Course time usually includes opportunities for students to reflect on and converse about their projects, and sometimes this is done through journaling. And these are some examples, and again, there are a lot of different ways to do service learning. So if any of you have ideas about how you could imagine that this might work, I'd be more than happy to hear them and let you more about what, let you know more about what I've seen in the past. Next slide, please. In the role of project matchmaker, a lot of my work involves clarifying expectations. I try to give community partners an idea as to what is being expected of them and an idea as to what they can expect to get out of the collaboration. Some of these include how often the community partners are expected to meet with their student group. Will they be asked to fill out a student evaluation at the end of the summer or semester? Also along the lines of clarifying expectations, we identify the expected deliverable that community partners can expect to receive by the end of the semester. Some examples of deliverables were mentioned earlier, such as social media content, survey development, program evaluation, and creating policy manuals. But these were just some examples of deliverables. There are many others that would be mutually beneficial for community partners and students. In addition to these items, another area for consideration is how many projects would be a good fit for the course. And this last bullet point, foster a partnership mindset is less straightforward than the others. As we mentioned earlier, a goal of ours is for these collaborations to be mutually beneficial. Students gain hands-on experience and increase their marketability while community partners receive assistance in an area they've identified. It's a delicate balance to have so many partners involved between faculty, students, and community partners. And it seems to me that an area of great importance is to foster and maintain a partnership mindset where each party is acknowledged and appreciated for what they bring to the table. And next slide, I will hand it back to Emily. So I also wanted to share a little bit about our vision for this program and how we see this having an impact on the university as a whole. So we really envision we see you as one of the ways that the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign can become a leading service institution um, with engagement happening at many levels of students and faculty and staff and instructors and um, meeting the needs of local community members. So with that, we really envision that through this program, our students will be engaged in meeting community needs. They'll gain valuable hands-on experiences in the community that make them more employable. And they'll graduate with an expanded worldview and a greater understanding of how they might contribute to our larger society. Our instructors will be engaged in meeting community needs through their teaching and have access to hundreds of community partners to cultivate projects for their courses. And they will also meaningfully participate in public engagement in the classroom. And our community partners, some of whom um, are featured on this slide, will be able to access the resources of the entire university through one contact point and view the university as a valuable partner for enhancing their work as well as being able to increase their ability and capacity to serve the community. And so with that, I'll turn it back to Katie to talk a little bit about how you can partner with us. Yeah, thanks Emily. The next few slides will talk about next steps for how the different groups can work with us. Next slide, please. And those groups include students, instructors, and community collaborators. And the next steps are broken up into these groups. Next slide, please. For students, our next enrollment period starts in May. And students are encouraged to either attend the live info session or view the recorded version. They visit this website for more information, as well as to find the link for the info session. Next slide, please. How do instructors partner with WeCU? They contact me for an initial meeting 
As I mentioned earlier, our first steps will be to learn more about the course and to clarify expectations. From there, our team will work on identifying projects that would be a good fit for the course. Community partners may have already submitted projects that would be a good fit. And if not, we can reach out to our community partners and offer them the opportunity to work with the course. Next slide, please. How do community partners join? Community partners can reach out to Emily or I for more information and they can submit projects to our brief online application here. Next slide, please. We thought we'd leave you with one of our favorite quotes by Andrew, a WeCU scholar. The time I spent talking with artists and student leaders and civil servants who approach their jobs with real excitement and generosity has made me more aware of humankind's potential to be kind and do good. The culmination of all that knowledge absorption has been a lot of growth, and I believe I am a little wiser and kinder than I was before. So with that, I will um, end screen share. We'll close this formal part of the presentation and we really look forward to an exchange with all of you and answering the questions that you've already posted in the chat. Great, thank you so much. So yes, we are open to questions. Um, and I don't know if anybody wants to ask a question. You can put your hand up or uh, you can signal in the chat that you're interested in asking a question. Um, I wanted to kind of um, begin by having you talk a little bit about the prior how to prioritize and why to prioritize the community partner dimension of this um, and how challenging that is or whether it's just so baked in that you feel like, I mean, you guys are always correcting me because I, I see the student learning side and recently in a little wordsmithing we were doing, Emily was like, eh, community partner goes first and then <laughs> so maybe you could because I think that you know we all understand the pitfalls of this one directionality um, and the the urgency of really meeting the needs of the people that we and, and you want to serve but I, I want to hear you talk more about the philosophy and the kind of ethical commitments behind that prioritization of the community partner. Katie, do you want to start or would you like me to? Yeah, I can, I can start. I don't have my answer um, officially organized in my mind, but that's a really, <laughs> that's a really great question. The very, a very simplified version of an answer to that is that if, if the university wants to do community engagement and do it well, we need to figure out a way to do it that's beneficial for community partners. Otherwise, it just isn't going to work. Okay. One of the things that I can add to that is when I started this role uh, three years ago, I initially had a very faculty focused role. And one of the challenges that I ran into with a role that was about cultivating community partnerships specifically for faculty was that a lot of the requests that came from community partners as I went out and spoke with community leaders and partners really were best matched with student skill development. And so that is really the point when I met Katie very early in my time here who had been doing this work with matching projects with students and we talked about how can this framework support both students and faculty. And one way of doing that, which still leads with the community partners needs <laughs> is by matching these projects and courses where faculty are the instructors and are meaningfully contributing to public engagement, but as instructors facilitating this process. Now, of course, that's not the only way um, and there are other ways and, and models that we've been working on. Um, but I think that was a meaningful point to me that, that continues to kind of stick out that a lot of the needs can be and should be met by students. And what a great opportunity then for our students too, um, to then work on these hands-on problem, you know, real world um, 
and, and understand that this campus is a part of the community, that it's not campus and community. Thanks. Can you talk a little bit about last summer and what students actually did and um, what, what the remote, I mean, remote, remote service sounds so, um, I don't know what the word is. I mean, I'm, I'm sure I'm seeing it through the lens of March, 2021, but it, it seems just so kind of depressing, but I know from watching the graduation and, or the recognition ceremony um, and listening to students talk that, that they were just completely thrilled by, by their experiences. Can you say a little bit more about what people did and why they felt so enthusiastic about a kind of you know, Zoom, Zoom experience? I can start on this one. Um, so at the beginning of the summer, really in the spring, we thought that we'd be launching We See You in the fall. That was the plan. And so we had to very rapidly transition to launch on June 1st. And we mentioned some of the reasons why we did that and why that made sense. Um, but then as Katie also mentioned, when we issued this call to students, um, which was really a call to action, um, that community partners need help and we need you. Um, we had more than 500 students sign up for information sessions within three days. And we were just sort of blown away because our impression was that students were so overwhelmed by uh, everything going on that maybe there wouldn't be tremendous interest and in such a big commitment. Students were committing to 40 hours of service across the summer, um, but that was not the case students were really interested. And I think that um, from talking to students, what they really loved was um, the feeling like they were contributing at a time when everyone was feeling very powerless um, and also the connection that they were able to have with the community partners, with other students and with the program team. We had graduate students who led uh, bi-weekly reflection sessions in small groups of students. And the attendance at those sessions was pretty high and the students really wanted to talk about what they were experiencing. And um, then we had students meeting regularly in their teams to work on the projects. And Antoinette, one of your questions was, what were they actually doing? What kinds of projects could they do remotely? So one area that um, emerged as a theme of projects was working on senior isolation. And, um, you know, a lot of people were very concerned about not only their own family members, but also the community at large that was basically closing their doors, whether in a nursing home or in a uh, you know, any, any kind of housing um, as we quickly discovered how dangerous COVID-19 was to that population subgroup. And so students wrote really beautiful letters that they would send regularly and decorate to seniors. Um, students uh, developed exercise programs and ran live programming for seniors um, in partnership with Circle of Friends, a local senior program. Um, and so that was one area that sort of emerged as, as both an area of, of interest and, and also something that could be done virtually. Um, another project that Katie and I often talk about, which was very unique to that moment, was sewing masks. Um, and this one doesn't necessarily develop a skill set that they're learning in the classroom, but we still felt, found that students wanted to do this on top of whatever else they were doing. And so there was a student in the School of Social Work who organized I believe it was 30 other WCU students to, and she trained them in how to sew masks and they sewed hundreds of masks um, at a time, you might remember on June 1st, it was really hard to get cloth masks. Um, we had just transitioned from the messaging that we shouldn't be wearing masks to we should. And, um, and so there wasn't much of a supply. And so they donated those to places like Crisis, crisis Nursery and other places that reached low income families um, with those masks right away. Um, those are, there, there's so many different examples. Um, Katie, do you wanna add? Those were great examples. I was thinking of the mask making and 
um, at first, when COVID first hit, you know, so much of what we do is connected to community partners and projects that they identify. And it felt like when COVID hit, that everything kind of went quiet in that space. Right. And of course, community partners were doing a rapid shift to all of the challenges that came with COVID days, just like the rest of us were trying to wrap our heads around work and life and school, et cetera. And it seemed like there was a pause in, in project submissions to us. Um, but it, it didn't take long for that shift to kind of head back for, and for community partners as they wrapped their heads around how they'll do a lot of their work remotely. They also identified um, the projects that would be best suited for students and that, that those projects could take a load off of, of their workload. Um, and so in addition to the masks, and the material translation that I mentioned, and that was such a cool project this summer because a community partner said, hey, I need help translating these materials into these languages. And we worked closely with the Humanities Professional Resource Center. They sent out a call to their students and within about a week, we had connected wow. students to the organization to help out with the material translation. And I think that's just such a cool example because Again, not everybody could do that. Um, and then in addition to those projects, students were helping with things like social media. And there was, a, there was a large event, the Disability Resource Expo. It, it happens here locally. Some of you may have heard of it, where they had kind of an open house of all the local providers and community members would come and learn about the resources available to them. So they figured out how to do their resource expo online and they used students to help create videos um, about each of those resource providers and that's such a cool project something that students can help out with that was a real benefit to the community. That's great I, I love the range of um, care and repair uh, examples together with kind of infrastructural and technical assistance, I think that's a, a really interesting combination of, um, of work uh, to, to encourage students to both think about, but also get good at. Um, uh, Olivia had a question in the, in the chat about, um, thank you very much for the presentation, and, and how have you worked with, or partnered with graduate students on campus? You made, I think, a reference to them in the reflection sessions, but what can you say about how graduate students can be involved in this? Yeah, I can answer this one. And there's really three ways that graduate students are involved right now. Um, so the first is that they can be WCU scholars as well. So um, Katie mentioned a couple of service learning courses that are offered at the graduate level and graduate students can also track their hours towards recognition. Um, their recognition looks a little bit different because of the structure of their program. So it's an annual recognition as opposed to a set number of years in the way undergraduates have. Um, but we really encourage graduate students to participate. And we think a lot of the projects that we match are very well suited to graduate students' skill sets as well. Um, the second way that graduate students can participate is again through the, the program as a whole, but we offer an option um, every time a student signs up for a, a service project in our system, there's an option to apply as team leader. And so every project has a team leader that is the primary contact point for the community organization. We think this makes it a little easier on the community organization to not have to coordinate across a large group of students, but have a, a primary mm -hmm. contact. Mm -hmm. And we do prioritize graduate students for those roles um, because they do often have um, the maturity that it takes to take on a role like that. Um, and so that's a second way. And then the graduate students that we mentioned are actually the graduate RAs that are employed um, to work on WeCU. So that's a, a third way, that's a small team, but a mighty team who uh, work closely with Katie and myself to really manage the day-to-day -day needs of the large pool of students volunteering. Um, they help us to run information sessions and trainings and reflection sessions and to answer 
the very, very large number of questions we get from students on a weekly basis, as you would imagine. Great, thank you. That second um, example you gave raises a really interesting, of how graduate students fit in, raises a really interesting question. I heard you saying that um, you are encouraging there to be a team leader because in some ways having volunteers for a community organization which is stretched or under pressure or really you know, facing crisis situations can in a way be a burden um, if it's not thoughtfully curated you know, in partnership with that, with that group. And, and so I wonder if you have any, the insights that you might have gained um, over the last year where, I mean, it's been, you know, hyper crisis moment um, and where you might imagine that a, um, even a well-managed team of volunteers, if not thoughtfully um, sort of negotiated could, could not be worse than none, but I mean, they're just, there's a kind of capacity question. The capacity question is critical. They need capacity, but it has to be uh, thoughtful and kind of, I don't want to say regulated or monitored because that sounds way too disciplinary, but it just has to be thoughtfully negotiated. Do you have insights about, about that mm -hmm. as a result of the last year? Yeah, I'll jump in a little bit here. And and I, I agree with what you were saying, Antoinette, you used the word burden and I, I wouldn't necessarily disagree. And that's part of what we try to alleviate from community partners. We've heard them say, you know, I'd love to have students um, help me with certain projects, but it's a lot for them to manage, especially if a dozen students are contacting them, contacting them and saying, hi, I'm in this class, can I do a project for you? And so we want to act as kind of the middleman to start with the community partner and identify, you know, well, what is the project and how many students would you like? How many hours do you imagine this project will take each week? Um, and then we just try to take on that role so that the community partner, who, as you mentioned, might be um, already stretched, wouldn't have to negotiate those aspects. And your comment, Antoinette, your question made me think about group service projects in the community. And I think, you know, when, when things are in person, there are many student groups or classes that are interested in doing large service events in person, and they'll contact an organization and say, hey, I've got 30 students who want to help. What can we do? And that those types of service projects, I think, all very often can fall under the category of being a burden on community partners if, if I don't know, they're just unleashed on the community partner. Um, yeah. So, those so what, are, yeah. yeah. What you're backlighting for us, I think, is how incredibly important these strategic filters and nodes are that you provide and how um, equally important it is that you be resourced so that you can really expand to the capacity and, and kind of imagine, you know, over the next five years, what you want your own, you know, kind of conceptual filters to be, I guess. And it is the more you talk, the more I think we all can see how incredibly important this is for campus and community um, and all of the, the multiplier effect of, of what you're doing um, really comes into view. Um, we've got a really diverse set of people here. I don't wanna call anybody out, but we've got some people from the library, the archives, campus honors. I don't know if anybody wants to ask a, a question about the students that they engage with and how, they, how you all might, um, might work with We See You. You can unmute and ask your question if you want. Or not. <laughs> Penny? Hello, yes. I'm actually retired from the university, but I'd like to congratulate Katie and Emily on what is, sounds to be an excellent program. I would like to just refer to the few final points about the structure, the organization, 
and the role of the team leader and the, the, the cross between burden and help. It sounds to me that this is just a great program and I really wish it will well. Um, I don't think I've met Emily. Um, I work with some students through the Atlas Applied Technologies with some interns um, through a, as a volunteer and I'm the volunteer coordinator mm. for this program. And it is a lot of work to try and make sure that it is beneficial to, to everybody. So um, I don't have a specific question, I just say, make sure you keep it going because this is so, so necessary. But at the end of the, and at the, end of the day, it's the impact on the broader community in Champaign-Urbana that counts and the fact that the university is making a real connection for its students, many of whom did not necessarily come from the sort of backgrounds that um, some of our organizations and nonprofits, many of them are serving in the community. So thank you so much. And thank you, Antoinette, for hosting this. Thank you, Penny. And you helped me to sharpen, um, I think what I was trying to say a little ham-handedly earlier, which is that it's really easy to look at WeCU and see the labor and the service of the students. But I guess what, what I was trying to suggest is that there's a lot of invisible labor behind the scenes that requires a really infrastructural capacity that we have to be really invested in helping to grow and sustain. But apropos of your last comment, Penny, I wonder if you two could address, Emily and Katie, this question of, you know, we've talked a lot about COVID and the crisis of health and wellness, um, both physical and also, of course, mental. Um, but we also, I mean, it was the summer of 2021, was the summer of George Floyd and Black Lives Matter. And for some people brought the convergence of the crises um, into view, although for many people, including you all, I know, and many people here, we've, we've, long, been, we've long been aware of racial disparity, whether we work in health or education or really any aspect of professional life, we should be aware of that. How do you, as you grow we see you and you um, think about its role how do you keep questions of um, racial justice and social equity by design to the fore and how could you use help um, in in making sure that that remains a kind of vertical and horizontal commitment for we see you mm -hmm. um, i'll jump in with maybe a, a bit of a shorter answer but I mentioned earlier that we sent out a call to community partners and asked specifically for their projects that would be well suited for students within the humanities. And some of the examples of projects that we included had an anti-racism theme, projects related to anti-racism, and the community partners responded. They submitted a decent amount of projects that fell under that theme, um, which shows to me that they're ready to address these problems. They're ready to collaborate with students on these types of um, projects. And I think we can keep that as a forefront of the program by continuing to ask for community projects that fall under that theme. And we're also working on trainings for our students that um, enhance their mindsets in this regard as well. Cool. Emily, did you want to pick up on that? I did, yeah. Sorry, I accidentally uh, opened the slides again. I was trying to pull up an example of a project <laughs> oh. that I wanted to share. Um, but I wanted to add to Katie's answer that um, we have been working on developing a training that we want all students to go through in relation to your question, um, where they develop a certain um, sense of cultural humility and have some understanding about the kinds of populations that they're going out to serve and think, uh, reflect on their own privilege and how that might influence the way that they relate to the projects they're taking on. Um, and up to now, we've been asking all students to take a training like this, but from existing trainings on campus. Um, and we want one that's integrated within WCU so that it really feels like it's a part of the program and that all students go through this. It's also a part of the existing reflection questions, but it's not currently a formal training module. Um, and yeah, I will say that um, it was on the minds of our students. It came up a lot in reflection sessions. Um, 
our students are also a very diverse group of students. Um, 36% of the WCU scholars are first generation college students. Um, so we also see that um, certain students are really drawn to this kind of work. Um, and we really want to lift them up and support them through this as well. So I think there's a lot of dimensions to your question. Um, one of the projects that's going on right now um, that I joined a meeting for last week, a group of students are working on vaccine hesitancy in the local community and creating different media campaigns that will help to address specific community concerns of different um, population subgroups. And so um, they have, um, with you know, assistance of organizations, they have gone out and have asked community members about reasons for declining the vaccine and have started to work on very sort of population specific campaigns. One campaign um, that they were speaking about in the meeting was um, focusing specifically on community members who have disabilities or mobility impairments and creating a video that shows the process of arriving in your car for the yeah. vaccine. Someone greets you with a wheelchair and helps you into it, transports you to the vaccine site and mm -hmm. transports you back to your car. And if anyone feels uncomfortable exiting the car, that they'll actually come out and give you the vaccine right in your car. And these kinds of things are just really, we're finding unknown um, and not well communicated right now. And so um, I think the students are learning a lot about issues very connected to those kinds of questions um, without maybe always working directly in anti-racism work. Right. Um, Olivia's thrown a comment into the chat about how urgent it is to think about um, seeding or sedimenting this kind of work in graduate uh, curriculum um, itself um, and, and rather than it being extraneous. Um, but Mara um, from the library also has a question, which I think you can see there. Uh, Mara, I don't know, do you wanna ask it or should I read it? I can ask it, I can be a little social here. Um, Thank you. <laughs> so so uh, I, I work with the library, I'm the South Asian Studies Librarian and I have partnered with um, community organizations in the past on some of my own projects and there've been grant opportunities on campus kind of related to building community connections. Um, but I'm curious because sometimes I think I'm limited by my own imagination. Do you all have like any project wish lists where you're looking for community collaborators or or to what extent do you kind of, um, are, are you in the business of connecting other campus entities with community organizations? I mean, I can think of a lot of ways with some of the projects you're talking about that the library could um, be involved, but it's also almost overwhelming because of some of the amount of potential overlap and also, you know, some of the projects are more directly potentially benefiting the library. So I, I guess I'm just curious about how, how we could get involved and, and if you have sort of like project wish lists or things like that, um, because I, I do see some similarities in our missions and values. If that makes sense, you can ask for clarification. It's a really broad question. Mm -hmm. um, I think it makes sense. And if I'm off base, then please feel free to redirect me. Um, nothing jumps out at me as far as a wish list. Oh, and I should mention, my I froze a minute ago, so hopefully I won't have any more internet issues. But um, as far as working with campus units, one way that we can do that is we have worked with campus units where they're kind of in the role of a community partner, where they get students to help them with projects. And, you know, we do want there to be benefit to non-campus organizations, but there might be certain projects that the library could do with a group of students helping with the project that could be shared with community partners. Um, maybe the library has a project where they want students to do more research on resources available in the community. Sorry, I can't think of a more unique example right now, but students could help the library with that. And then we could help disseminate 
the results of that project to community partners, if it would make sense to do so. Yeah, some of the stuff that I had in mind, like that we had talked for a while, there was a core grant thing uh, that was available at some point about whether the library would have a role in hosting critical conversations about community issues. And so um, some of that is, you know, providing a venue and an infrastructure and kind of like the mini grants you were talking about where people could come together and talk about issues they have in common, identify issues and try to um, solve them. So that's where I'm seeing some overlap, but I'm not sure if the, um, you know, we weren't able to proceed with that and I'm not sure, you know, I, I don't know. I, I guess I just wanted to um, say that we, we could have some ideas and I, I have some other things that you just inspired and I will follow up without making everyone listen to this. So expect an email from me. Please do. I, this sounds really exciting. I'd love to hear more about it. And I think talking more does make sense as, as a next step. You're giving me ideas as well. Aslan, I think you had a, you unmuted at one point. Did you want to say something? I had too many thoughts pinging around in my head okay. and I wasn't, it, I could form a real question. Really what I'm, I'm also a grad student um, over in the creative writing department. Although I also work with the Odyssey project. Um, I guess my, my question was following up tomorrow's in a lot of ways of thinking about, I know a lot of grad students who would be excited, I think for this kind of work and then trying to think through my, I have a kind of a practical or I don't know, a literal brain trying to think through like what the, uh, what the steps would actually be to be trying to like pull some of my friends into being involved in this kind of work. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess the questions there are like, is the like, is the model that's most useful for this program's develop, uh, momentum that they would reach out to you and ask like kind of where, where could I help with something? Is the model that at this moment, it's really useful to have people kind of dreaming and pitching new ideas through the, um, through the form that's available on your website that I was looking at a moment ago. Mm -hmm. um, and then also what, like, what resources are there for a grad student uh, thinking, and right, grad students are also instructors. So thinking about how with their classes or with their own work, they wanna get involved, what resources are there for kind of uh, examples of what's being done uh, to help paint the mm -hmm. kind of rough outline of what is possible, what kind of thing they should be thinking about, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Again, if I was rambling, uh, mm -hmm. I apologize. I think I can answer that question. Um, there were a few different elements to it. So Katie might have to help me with ones that I miss. Um, every, at the start of every semester or summer, we do an open call for graduate students and undergraduate students interested in joining We see you and contributing. And I think that we, we've only done this three times, right? One in the summer and the fall and the spring now. Um, and I think there's opportunities for us to improve that to attract more graduate students because right now we are attracting many more undergraduates than graduate students. Um, but the way that students become involved then if they're joining through this open call and not through a course is um, that they attend an information session and then they join um, a group that we've created on a platform called Give Pulse, which is a um, service matching um, program that has been um, purchased by the Office of the Chancellor and is being slowly rolled out campus-wide. We were one of the pilot groups. And so from there, a graduate student who joins could essentially look through the opportunities on there. There are dozens and start to get a feel for what kinds of things are available and what might fit his or her interest, skill set, et cetera. Um, and I think that... Um, you know, that's, that's the way that a lot of students are, are coming to us now is through this open pool rather than through a class. Um, if I could follow up on that quickly, is there, a, is there a method for joining the open pool besides at the beginning of each semester? So we offer a month long enrollment. Um, so it's a pretty large percentage of the semester, I guess, in which students can join us. The reason that we try to keep it contained to that month is that we want to get back to community partners in a timely manner. And if we let it go on too much longer, we worry about um, it just taking too long to get those students connected to that community partner. Um, but of course, community partners do not operate on a 
semester schedule. And so they do submit projects to us outside of the semester framework. So if a student wants to join outside of that window, we often still have service opportunities. So if you're interested, for example, or if you have a group of students who are interested, please reach out to me or to Katie, um, because currently we do have a few projects that we did not fill this semester and we're eager to find students who might take those on. We really would love to have every need filled every semester. Well, on that note um, of optimism and urgency, um, we should close because we're at the top of the hour, but this was really just absolutely fantastic. And thank you so much, Emily and Katie, for your labor on a daily basis, but also for um, coming together at a very busy time in the middle of the afternoon to share this with us. Thank you, Neil, for all your perspicacity, Neil. <laughs> he loves he loves the word surfing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, really all kidding aside, um, you know, real, real intelligence, uh, uh, emotional and otherwise about how important this work is and for to I, HSI for supporting it. Um, and thanks to everyone who has come. Um, if you're interested, we have an event coming up uh, at HRI on Thursday at four o'clock. Our colleague Jenny Breyer at UIUC We'll be talking about um, the fact that um, we're coming up, of course, on a big anniversary for the pandemic, a year since shutdown, but this is also the 40th anniversary of the first AIDS case in the United States. And so she'll be asking us to think about how to think about those two things together. And that seems like a really timely, kind of uncannily timely um, event this Thursday at four o'clock. And Lydia has thoughtfully put the information um, in the chat we also have our uh, fourth annual uh, celebration of International Women's Day next Monday, um, where we have 12 uh, women who changed the world. You will recognize some of our campus leaders and some of your colleagues in the mix of people who'll be giving their five minute spiel. We open with Senator Tammy Duckworth uh, and we close with President Tim Colleen. And in between we have everyone from Susan Martinez to Sean Garrick to many others as well. So um, you'll see lots of people you know, lots you don't, and you'll get to learn about 12 women you may never have heard of before who changed the world. So to Katie and Emily who are changing the world, thank you again so much. And we'll look forward to seeing you all uh, at other HRI events. Thanks everyone. <laughs>